Hey everyone, the young, the young hearts. Big hugs to all of you from Pearl by Heartfulness, and I'm Lakshmi Most. We're all creative in different ways, and research suggests that people who laugh a lot and enjoy life or live life in a lighter mood are much more creative and, and experience many eureka moments in their life. But well, that kind of explains all the laughs that I've had on my own. I must be a naturally creative person, I guess. Uh, but seriously, guys, have you thought of, you know, extending or enhancing your creativity, harnessing your creativity into innovation to improve the world where you live in? I think that's what this webinar is about, to get inspired, to inspire others, to unleash the inner creativity and innovation within us. Now, this webinar is in collaboration with Infinite Youth. And as you can see, I have a young panel of youth from different parts of the world here. And it was an absolute pleasure to work with each one of them the past week. And they just make me feel much younger. And today they bring in an energy of excitement, wonder, and freshness to this webinar. And together, we are just extremely delighted and crazy to welcome the young inventor, Canadian inventor, the coolest, the smartest game changer, Anne Makasinski. Yay! Yay! Hi, everyone. Thank you so much yeah. for having me. So excited to be here. And by the way, you know, I just wanted to tell you uh, normally we're not this crazy just so you know. And uh, <laughs> before we get to, uh, you know, interact with you, I'd love to introduce you properly to our audience. And uh, so here we go. Anne is a 23 year old Filipino Polish Canadian inventor. And by the way, she's also from Vancouver. She's uh, from my hometown, but at the moment she's living in New York. She is an aspiring writer, a keynote speaker, CEO of Mechatronics Enterprises Inc. And she's best known for her invention of the hollow flashlight that runs off the heat of our, of our hand and the e-drink that um, uses the energy from the drink to charge a cell phone. I mean, isn't that cool, guys? Yeah, yeah. I think so too. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And uh, she has given five TEDx talks and she's one of the Forbes magazines 30 Under 30. Times Magazine's 30 Under 30, World Changers, Entrepreneur Magazine's Young Millionaires, and Glamour Magazine's College Women of the Year, and Popular Science Magazine's Young Inventor of the Year. She recently completed her work on a line of children's toys that runs off green energy. She appeared in Jimmy Fallon on his premiere week, hosting The Tonight Show twice. Now, Han has frequently traveled around the world delivering keynote talks and her awards and accolades are just numerous. They're endless, I should say. It's really an honor uh, for me and this team to be talking to you, Anne. And it's what a great pleasure to meet you finally. Um, Thank you. Thanks. I'm excited Anne. to be here. Awesome. So let's get started. Now, you seem to have this incredible, diverse range of experience already. And it's just 23 Gosh, you're just half my age. Looking back at your uh, childhood, Anne, were you sort of a child that asked a lot of uh, questions, curious child, you know, trying to fix things and find solutions? Yeah, I definitely asked a lot of questions, um, I think, and I found that science had the answer to kind of my preliminary questions of how the world worked around me, which was, I think, the main questions I was asking as a child. So. Uh, yeah, I was definitely a very curious child. You were okay, interesting, and that kind of led you from uh, tinkering to innovation, as you as you say it. And I'm sure you must also have been a resilient child, right, to go through this innovation cycle of, uh, you know, uh, try, fail, try again, right, at such an age. Wow. Now, were you a straight A student? You must have been, right? Um, honestly, I I was a straight A student for like middle school, which really doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and then high, early high school I was, and then grade 11 and 12, my grades definitely plummeted uh, due to a multitude of reasons, but mainly because I wasn't 
at school a lot. I started traveling a lot to speak or go to science fairs. And also at that point, I realized what mattered more was what I did outside of school versus what I was doing inside of school, which might be controversial for, for some people to hear. But I truly believe, you know, at the end of the day, if we are privileged enough, we are all graduating with a high school degree. So what really matters is what differentiates you and what you're doing outside of your school time. Um, and I was actually learning the most outside of school, uh, definitely with my science fair projects and things like that. I couldn't agree more, you know, I think uh, we'll get into a lot of trouble with the parents who are hearing this, but the youths are going to love mm -hmm. it. So that's great. And, you know, in fact, and I also had moved from a school of thinking where I used to think education is everything to, as you say, learning outside of school. And that kind of adds up to the holistic education one gets, right? Mm -hmm. It's really more more valuable than the marks and grades that we get in. Absolutely, totally agree with you. And now I'm going to pass it on to the team who have been eagerly waiting to ask their questions to you. And I just wanted to say that each one of them here, they're catalysts, they're youth catalysts in their respective countries in the Hotfulness Infinite Youth Community. The first up is Aditi from India. Hey, Anne, so good to see you here. Hi. So and it's so nice to hear that you were kind of, you know, a person, an outgoing person, if I'm right. Semi, yes. I mean, I'm introverted, but I'm also outgoing. Lovely. <laughs> Depending so, on the you situation. Know, uh, sorry. Um, you know, uh, I while you were talking about this fact, uh, we the youth in this time, you know, in this uh, the generation where we are in, um, we feel good when we get a lot of attention. And at such a young age, when you know you have invented something which has gone global, and people now know you. So, uh, was it difficult for you to, um, you know, go up on the stage and start talking to the public and interact with them? How were you with grabbing that attention, and how do you, how did you take this aspect of attention that you were receiving? Um, honestly, I didn't really expect any of it. I mean, I was just doing science fair projects because I liked doing science fair projects. And then my flashlight project went viral. And it was very surprising because I, I truly was never a kid that was like, I want to be known as a science genius. I was like, never, never my intention. All my friends from high school can tell you that. Um, so I was just doing these projects for fun. And then, you know, a lot of attention happened. It was definitely, I think it was a very interesting time because I think it really confused myself as a 15 year old to when I was like 19 or 20 even about what my identity was and how people perceived me versus what I wanted to do. Um, but it was a very interesting time of my life for sure. And I'm so lucky to have had that experience and have met so many cool, amazing, inspiring people. Um, but <clears throat> I mean, public speaking wise, getting on stages, I had been basically training for that by doing science fair projects and presenting them over and over and over again to people from all different backgrounds and age ranges. So public speaking, although, you know, like the first, I'd say five talks, I was writing them and trying to memorize them. After that, I kind of gave up and just improvised on stage. And I found that a lot more easier. So yeah, I really like public speaking. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. I mean, it's so much of resonance. It, it feels so nice to know how your journey, you know, started off with this invention. Uh, thank you for yeah. answering that. You know, I, I will now pass it on to my buddy from Ecuador, Juan. Hi, Juan. Hi, Anne. My name is Juan. I am from Ecuador. I wanted to ask you a question that probably you have been asked this question a lot, but I wanted to know as an inventor, what motivates you to create things or what's your biggest motivation, your inner motivation? Um, I've always had a big inner motivation, I guess, to not waste my time. Um, and, you know, we only, we all have a limited amount of time on this planet. So I always feel like, how can I be constructive? How can I be productive with my time? Just some respect, you know, obviously I take time off, but that's a big motivator. And then obviously when you are an inventor, usually the only times you can really complete a whole project is when you're like personally, like your emotions are attached to the person um, or problem that you're trying to solve or help. Um, so that definitely has been kind of the thing where, you know, I made the flashlight for my friend in the Philippines who didn't have light at the time. And then the e-drink came out of 
my friends at high school run their phones are running out of battery and their coffee was taking too long to cool down and the line of children toys children toys that i made um were kind of motivated also out of my own kind of curiosity because when i was a kid i didn't have that many toys so i was thinking what would be cool to have as a kid right now um, that could also lean into the area of green energy so yeah i think personal connection always um deepens the experience when you're making inventions you know, it's interesting because I'm trying to manage my time in a very effective way nowadays, because in the past it was a mess and I think it's helping me to achieve more things that I used to achieve to also, you know, go into other fields of life. It's, it's, uh, I think it's very important. Thank totally. you for, yeah. Thank yeah, you for your answer. I passed. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm then sorry. I go ahead. I was just going to say time management is like, I think the key to life, but not, not to life, but um, it's, it's, it's up there in importance, but yeah. Thanks for your question. Yeah. Thank you. Now, uh, next question is from Saloni. Thanks, Juan. Uh, hi, Anne. This is uh, Saloni from Mumbai, and I'm a fellow entrepreneur here. So we are kind of sailing in the same boat, and I feel you. So, uh, you know, based on that, uh, based on the wonderful uh, innovations that you just shared, uh, you know, they're all based on harvesting energies. And uh, like you just said, you like to be productive with time. So as youth, there is a lot of energy that is bubbling, and uh, we need to utilize that in a productive manner. So how did you do it and what were the challenges or how did you direct yourself to use it for productive manner and b there, there would have been times where you had to sacrifice a lot on uh, going around with friends or you know or maybe just sacrificing time with family so was there a feeling of FOMO yeah definitely especially in my grade my senior year of high school I got a lot of FOMO because like my, there would be like school events or dances and I would have to stay back and like do my science for projects, stuff like that. <laughs> so I definitely had that feeling, but I guess an, another part of me, even though I hated to admit it, knew that what I was doing would be worthwhile, you know, for the future. So I kind of kept working on stuff. Um, and to answer the first part of your question, um, I think the only reason I was able to complete any project at that age was because of deadlines and strict parents. Um, otherwise I just like, I don't think it's so hard for teenagers to set out and like actually finish something, especially if you're not getting graded for it in school. I think it's so difficult. So having parents that were very encouraging and you know strict to me like, have you done your science project yet? And you know, like guiding me through that was very helpful or else I truly would have been a complete mess and not finished any of it. Wonderful. I think uh, what you made a beautiful point out there that you constantly gave hope to yourself, like, and you believed in yourself that this is what I'm doing. And at the end, I need to sacrifice something. And, and it's yeah. good to know that uh, you took the strictness of your parents in the right manner. Wonderful. <laughs> I got frustrated at times. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I think I'll just pass on the next question to Mitch. And this is Mitch from Canada. Hi. Uh, I, uh, I work in a, like a production setting. So this question kind of deals with that. Um, so we really only see your inventions once they go into production or even after they go into production. But what we don't really see are like the prototypes and all the modifications that you make along the way. So after you come up with an idea, um, do you kind of have a, like a, a plan or one like strong idea about how you're going to build it? Or do you just brainstorm a bunch of, uh, a bunch of ideas and then kind of carefully narrow it down and, and figure it out as it goes? Um, I definitely would brainstorm like a bunch of different ideas, choose one that I thought um, offered the most value to somebody um, in the sense like, what was already on the market and like how could my solution compare to that and did it offer something different and unique and better than previous iterations of it um and then i would start sketching the idea just on like pencil notepad you know whatever or with markers and then i start labeling things and with measurements estimating what it might look like then i would might like model it just out of cardboard or you know whatever materials i'd have and then i would start 
getting the actual materials to prototype it. Um, there's never like a straightforward way. I think every single person has a different way of creating and inventing. So it's difficult for me to be like, this is how you should do it. But that's my experience in the inventing world for sure. Awesome. Yeah, it's good to, to kind of see different perspectives and how people do it because mm -hmm. then, you know, different ideas come up to us and go, oh, you, I can try this way instead. So yeah, thanks, yeah totally. Um, I think it's, I think it's important to like, also think about like, is this invention possible, at least with my skills? And then if not, who do I need to recruit along to work alongside me to make the things that I'm going to be struggling with making? Um, many things like that. But yeah, actually, the one thing that I learned last year was inventing can also be like a team effort with a couple other people. And it's actually really fun because I did everything by myself as a kid. And while I really loved that as well i think it's actually almost better to surround yourself with people that are better than you and everything <laughs> yeah awesome yeah sounds like a fun organic process um i'll let uh, benedetta ask her ne next question thank you mitch so i'm benedetta from uh, italian and it's really a pleasure to meet you i have a question that uh, it's about uh, uh, our society, because uh, in our society, we we have a lot of uh, showing off, meaning that uh, social media may pressure us to present only our success and best accomplishment with the world. And it seems that failing sometimes is uh, it's like looked down on. So we become ashamed when it happens and we may restrict our creativity or risk taking. So this may also block us in a certain way and we may feel bad about ourselves, uh, inadequate or not good enough. So my question is that, uh, what do you think about making mistakes or failing in the creativity process? Um, I think it's, it's a great question. I think it's super natural to fail all the time and for things not to work out and also to accept some people's suggestions when they look at your work and you're like, Ugh, that is better. Like, why didn't I think of that? That's been really hard for me sometimes, especially when I was younger, getting any sort of criticism was like, ah, oh, what's happening? Um, but I think now I'm getting slightly better at receiving it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, failure is really hard. I think also comparing yourself to other people um, is very natural on social media. So I just try not to look at people. I just <laughs> can't. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, you know, I, but failure is totally part of the creative process. And that's what makes it so rewarding in the end when you finally um, get something that works, but also the whole creative journey, all the, all the ups and downs is also like a really beautiful and like emotional part that I also really enjoy. Yeah, thank you very much. Really, really nice answer to this and for having a complete vision also for for youth i think it's really important to, to see it this way also so yeah. i have, um yeah oh and, and i was just it's like not the end of the world if you know you fail something or something doesn't work or you don't get a good grade on something like it's i mean maybe i don't know if this is the best perspective for, for me when something doesn't go right i like try and zoom out and think of myself in the scope of the universe. And I'm like, oh, this, this is nothing. Like, this doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. But you know, everyone's different. Everyone has a different perspective. And obviously things can feel very dramatic in the moment. So I think it's always important to just to take a step back. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And I have a second question because uh, they say that routines and creating, creating habits, it's really important. So. My question is that, uh, do you have any routine or any process or rituals that you follow that helps you out for creating uh, or brings you in this, this state uh, that helps you to invent? Oh gosh, I mean, I probably should have routines. I don't know, every morning I get up and I like make Ovaltine or tea. Like I, I don't know, I, I was listening to this interview from the film director, David Lynch, and he was talking about how in the morning he does the exact same routine every day of like getting up, going to the bathroom, making a smoothie, having a food thing and sitting outside and having his coffee. And when he has a routine that he does the same thing every day, 
it allows his mind to wander more during that time because it's so comfortable with what's going on around him. Um, and then he's more creative and comes up with his best ideas then. So that's something I aspire to do. I just need to like implement that in my life. Um, but yeah, I don't have any routines at the moment. I guess just sitting down with a notebook and pen has always been kind of my go-to. Um, I always find I'm most, most creative in like inappropriate situations, like when I'm at parties or social events, because I mostly despise going to, going to a lot of those kind of things. Uh, I mean, I'll go if I'm invited, but I actually find I like sitting down with a notebook in the corner and coming up with ideas there. Yeah. Thank you very much. And so I pass to the next one. Yeah, um, I'll go next. Um, thanks, Anne, uh, for, for sharing so many insights with us and, you know, letting us know more about you. And it's really a pleasure to be with you today. I'm Shashi uh, from Canada. Um, my question is, do you think we need a mentor to be successful? I mean, I know you started young and especially because of that. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I was really lucky to have my father as a mentor, which is something I definitely do not take for granted. I think when I, when I was when I was a kid, I did. This is like, oh, he's bossing me around, I can do all these things. But it truly was um, such a phenomenal experience, and I'm so lucky to have had that, to have had someone that pushed me in that direction. But I also don't think your mentors need to be alive. I know that's a weird thing to say. Like when I was growing up, I had a lot of idols and people that I looked up to and would like research heavily like first in grade six I was obsessed with Harry Houdini the magician so I read all about his life watched all his films learned magic tricks and like renamed myself Andini then in grade seven it was like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers which were a dancing duo from the 30s so I like watched all their films I dressed like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers I like took a ballet class for a year which is so humiliating it's the worst experience of my life um so you know I, I've always had obsessions with different people and most of them are dead which I joke about but I truly feel like they also like I researched their lives to get a little piece of magic from them and I hope I can implement it in my own life if that makes any sense and yeah I think mentors can be both dead or alive if I don't know if I'm crazy because I like talk in my head sometimes to Elvis, but you know, I feel like it's totally fine to have people that you look up to and that may guide you in some way with their own life path um, that are in history versus alive. Yeah, no, not crazy at all. I mean, <laughs> I can completely relate to that because I mean, inspiration, you know, is not limited by time, right? So of course, yeah, yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks for answering. And um, uh, I'll let uh, Rushali go next. Uh, thank you, Shashi. And um, thank you, Anne, for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure to listen to you speak. And I completely forgot that I even had to ask you something because I was just busy listening to you. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm currently in um, clinical research at the moment at Boston University. And you are someone who's obviously into research and development and all of the amazing path-breaking technologies that you have literally created from scratch. Um, so I have, it's a two-part question because it's something that's really um, piqued my curiosity is that first of all, you know, what advice would you like to give to young girls who look up to you or young girls who wanna go into the field of STEM? Because we know that there's not, you know, obviously a little bit of a scarcity when it comes to girls and women in STEM. So what would you like to say to them? And my second part of my question is that, how do you deal with, you know, obviously being a young girl um, in a field predominantly, you know, populated by older men? Um, so how do you kind of cope with that? Or what are your ways of kind of going about it or making your own little changes along the way? So people that look like you, people that our girls can can sort of, you know, make a mark in an industry that's dominated by men. Right. Um, to answer the second part of your question first, it's interesting because when I did science fair and all of that, I didn't really think about the fact that there were a lot of less girls and guys. I kind of like arrived and just like did my own thing and <laughs> left. Um, but now I realize that, you know, now I like 
a few years later, I was like, oh my God, there's a huge scarcity of girls and whatever. But to some degree, I, I actually really valued my naivete at that point in my life because I, then I didn't really think about that or worry about that at all. And I was just like, I'm here, I'm presenting my project. It's probably better than all these guys who probably all like me. So it's like going to be fun. So <laughs> I don't need to worry about that. Um, but, you know, I, then when I started speaking at conferences when I was like 16, I, people would be like, why are you here? You know, and I would get a lot of that kind of thing because of my age and how I looked yeah. and like, they would be so surprised when I'd be like, oh, I'm the keynote speaker, like blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I've definitely had a lot of times where guys were just creepy in general at business meetings or, um, conferences and all of that. Ugh. I could tell you stories, but I won't. Um, and you know, I think I don't know what we should do about it because unfortunately I feel like a lot of men are going to continue to do that unless we like radically change the way we educate boys from like the age of 10 at schools of like how to Absolutely. treat women, be respectful and like, you know, in a working and professional situation and in like a normal casual situation. So, you know, now obviously with the Me Too movement and all that that came out a few years ago, I think that was really important to have and you know, there's been big steps in the entertainment industry, but still things are pretty messed up. So, you know, it's a difficult topic. And, you know, I've had a lot of friends who, you know, work in labs and like their coworker that was a guy tried to like sabotage everything or like really be horrible to them. So it's still a problem, unfortunately, that I see um, going on. But to young girls right now, who are looking to go into sciences. I mean, the advice I would give would just to be like, stand strong and like what you believe in. And if you believe you deserve credit on that paper or whatever that may be, like speak up and say it and call people out because I think that's the only way we can really go forward um, at the moment. Um, and also that you're in for a wonderful journey of ups and downs, but I think just being true to yourself and doing what you just feel comfortable with is kind of, or going outside of your comfort zone a little bit um, is definitely really important. I agree with you. I feel like two things that really resonated with what you just said is definitely that taking risks is important because I feel like there's no innovation without risk and yeah. the second part is obviously being authentic I think there's nothing better than just being yourself and just you know taking over you know dominating the world just by being genuine and by being yourself and I think that that's what you are and that's why I think you are where you are today and you know thank you so much for answering my questions and um, I think a lot of people out there listening really needed to hear that. Um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to popcorn it over to Andrew, who's going to take it up, take it over. Yeah, thank you, Brushali, for the wonderful question. And uh, hi, Anne. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Andrew from uh, Kenya. And um, uh, I'm a teacher by profession. And um, I like motivating my kids uh, whenever I'm in class. I like to, uh, motivating them because the word educate means to draw out mm -hmm. the best in kids. And um, from your experience, from your beautiful journey, from your very early beginning, I would say, to where you are now, uh, knowing what you know, uh, what advice would you give your younger self um, if you travel back and those moments where you felt like, um, uh, uh, people say, Anne, you can't do it, and you can't achieve what, you achieve what you're going to achieve. So what advice would you tell your younger self? Yeah. So oh, that's gosh. my question. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I would just tell myself to care less about what people think and to care less about my reputation or, or you know, things like that. I think I, I went through many years of my life. I'm, I mean, I'm still trying to claw myself out of it, but being really worried about how people perceived me, especially after people were like, oh, she's a science genius. And then I felt a lot of pressure to do certain things or dress a certain way or, you know, things like that. So I, I would just say to worry less in general, because you're going to get plenty of worries as an adult that you also don't want. So just to like enjoy time and like one thing I am grateful for that I feel like now is really hard for kids because of TikTok and social media and everything like that and their awareness is I really like was a teenager and I was a 13 year old kid when I was 13 instead of growing up super fast. Um, Cause I feel like so many kids now at 13, they look so put together and like they have everything figured out. And I'm like, that was not me at all. And I really am happy that that was me because 
I think if I'd grown up so fast and be, become obsessed with, uh, I don't know, like boys and fashion and makeup when I was 12 or 13, I would have been a completely different person. Not to say that I would have done inventing because, you know, by grade 11 and 12, I was watching YouTubers all the time and like, you know, doing makeup and like learning about fashion. But I, I think I was so, um, I had less distractions as a kid. So, and I just wish I had even less when I was a teenager. Um, but yeah, I think just worrying, not worrying about how people perceive me is so was a big thing that I wish I had taken to heart more when I was younger. Yeah, uh, that's lovely for sure. Like um, I understand uh, our society today, we like comparing ourselves so much with uh, mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, t uh, TikTok and all that. And uh, yeah, if there was a way we could just narrow it down, it would be wonderful. And like, it would give a chance for you and everyone else as youth to grow in a way mm -hmm. that uh, less distractions. Uh, thank you so much, and It's wonderful. I'm such a big fan. And uh, yeah, I'd oh, give this you. chance to Moses uh, to answer, ask you the next question. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I'm just going to interrupt, and Anne, I just wanted to say that that answer, I think, needs an applause because youngsters now need to learn to, yeah, I think we should make some noise <laughs> now. <laughs> yes. Yes. Woohoo! <laughs> particularly such a strong statement let's not worry about what others are thinking or perceiving uh, you to be and just be free and just enjoy your journey in life it's a wonderful answer and I uh, loved it there you go you. Moses see you yeah well I completely agree and uh, I mean my question is basically kind of about that um, as well so maybe maybe you can just shed some more light on it possibly but I was just going to reflect that I just appreciate that what you put out on social media is just so very authentic. Um, you're able to just embrace all aspects of who you are, you know, your, your love for cinema uh, as well as fashion. And, you know, you let your silliness come through and you just, there's lots of different aspects there. And so you've done a good job of kind of cultivating that not caring about uh, what other people think and just kind of uh, letting your true, uh, you know, interests and, and passions come through. Uh, and so my question is just, you know, how have you cultivated that inner confidence within yourself? Um, and what advice do you have for young people about how to kind of, you know, step forward and embrace all aspects of themselves and just live, live authentically? Oh, gosh. I mean, it's interesting because I think now when you're growing up as a 13 year old or 14 year old because of social media there's such an influx of visual stimuli and information that i think everyone is kind of searching for their identity and then seeing all these photos of what is cool right now to wear and fashion and all of that like that just must make it so much more difficult for young people right now versus when i was growing up uh, but um i think i think what actually really helped me become more confident in who I am and all the weird things that I like. Um, I'm in my apartment. I just moved in here, so it's really messy, but I have like a mannequin from like Kmart <laughs> that I grabbed and like put up and like, I am putting up all these photos of like old Hollywood actors soon and all this stuff. Um, but I think what, would, what made it a lot easier for me as I got older was the fact that I was always really proud of my weird obsessions. Um, like when I was obsessed with Houdini, I pasted his photo on my agenda and I brought it to all my classes. And then when I opened my locker up, you would see all these photos of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And like, this is not normal. Like I had no friends that did things like that or like liked the same old Hollywood people as I did. And I got teased. I remember I got teased a lot in middle school about that. And like, people would be like, eh, who's that? Like, he, you know, and I would just defend them and, and be very passionate about it. So I think that kind of defensiveness and pride about the people that I loved, even though they weren't alive, um, really helped me as an adult also just embrace all the weird things that I like. Like, I don't have any with me because they're all in Canada, but I love collecting bones of like, and skeletons of dead animals. And when I was a kid, I would collect all the dead birds and rabbits like remains in Victoria and like keep them in our freezer uh, for many years. My mom had to put up with that. So, you know, I had all these weird interests and I would just like embrace it and just go for it. And I think that's really important for kids to be proud of what they love 
Um, and hopefully parents and teachers can like really imbue that into kids that like whatever it is that you like, no matter how niche or bizarre it is, just like go for it. Because I think when you fully embrace your weirdness, that's when like people meet you and they're like, wow, she's really cool. Like She's so bizarre and she's really cool. So I think that's really important instead of like hiding behind, oh, everyone likes these things and watches these shows and dresses this way. So I'm just going to do that to fit in. Um, if anything, especially living in New York, the main thing that I've seen is like all the like the boring people in New York, the people who like are trying to fit in all the crazy interesting people are the people who you're like, oh my God, who is that? Um, when you meet them or see them on the street. So yeah, be proud of all the weirdness about you for sure. Mm, I love that. That's a perfect answer. Thank you so much. Thanks, Moses. Yeah. All right. I'll pass it on to uh, Margot. Hello, Anne. I'm Margot from Paris. And nice meeting you. And it's uh, so many things you said just resonated so much. And I, I have many ideas and things coming up to my mind, but I have to stick with two questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> actually, you just uh, replied to my, my question about being crazy, you know. Uh, as a child, I used to be a kid very cool, like weird, because I had like, I was obsessed with some topics and I was, I could mm -hmm. just search for it for hours and like weird topics. And this is why I picked this question, like, so you replied, but in which cases uh, do people, uh, did people tell you that you were crazy to do such or such thing? Um, I think generally, and multiple of my friends who are girls in science had this experience where, cause we were so young, people would be like, oh, you know, like they kind of discourage us from what we were doing because they're like, oh, wait till you're older. Like, then you'll see, or, you know, you, just like weird stuff like that. Like definitely had experiences like that um, where people just thought it was a bit weird for doing things. But I think it also came out of a place of insecurity or jealousy from them. So I never tried to take it to heart, um, you know, and, you know, people can say it. I mean, obviously it's different because if I had like millions of followers and they were all hating on me and what I was doing, I'm sure it would be a much more traumatic experience, but because it was usually just in person, like offhand comments or like the occasional mean comment or message on social media, it never, I never really try to take that seriously. Like I'll see it and I'll be like, oh, that sucks. And then I'll just delete it. Uh, so <laughs> sometimes you just got to be like, you know, if someone, someone's uncomfortable with what you're doing in life, then like you're probably doing something right. Like you're probably doing something that they're looking at and going, oh, I haven't done anything. So I'm just gonna like hate on this person. So I think it's important to just like see that and then just take that as fuel um, for your own creativity and work. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, what I feel is that behind what you're saying is that uh, patient is the, the motivation, the main motivation to just uh, go ahead and follow your, what you love. And mm -hmm. uh, actually I had a second question, but I think you also replied. It's about limitative beliefs. Do you feel like you have, you had limitative beliefs that really prevented you from going on with your invasions or with your patients? I had a lot of limiting beliefs about myself and my self-worth last year. Um, and I've been dealing with the consequences this year. <laughs> Uh, but it made me realize that I need to value myself and what I have to offer a lot more um, than I previously thought and to really take everything that I do in my career really seriously, even if at the time I feel like nothing's going to happen or like it's not a big deal or like I just don't. Yeah. Um, and, and really trying to like do as much research as possible before I enter anything or do anything in my life. Um, but yeah, I definitely, and when I was younger too, I had a lot of limiting beliefs of what I was, actually, no, when I, when I wanted to Google science fair, I remember I went up, cause I really didn't expect to win at all. I remember going on the stage when they called out my name and I was thinking like, anything is possible. Like I can do this, like I can do anything. And that was a really beautiful time in my life. Um, but I think as I got older, like I'd say starting at 20, I started getting a lot more limiting beliefs of what was possible. And then obviously I became known as like a child science genius. So then when I reached 20, I was like, oh, like each year I'd feel like, oh my God, I'm, I'm outdated. Like nobody's gonna be interested in me. Like I've aged out, like what am I supposed to do now? I peaked when I was 16. So 
that kind of belief has always bugged me, but I feel like the past year I've really started to let go of all of that and be like, that was just a segment of my life. And now I'm on a different segment where I can take what I've learned and like go even further. It reminds me of the beautiful quote from uh, Mark Twain. They didn't know that they couldn't do it, so they made it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it may be exactly what you, when you were younger, maybe you just didn't see the limits and you were just, uh, yeah. you know, Thank totally, you so much. Yeah. And I will pass it on, sorry, Aditi. Thank you. Uh, wow, Anne, you're such a go-getter. You know, after hearing okay. so many things about you, um, I'm, I'm so intrigued to ask you this question because I myself, I come from a science background. And uh, there was a time when I was uh, creating, uh, uh, you know, a working prototype a spaceship for which National Geographic awarded me. But I know what was the time and how difficult it is, you know, especially when there are so many competitors out there. Mm -hmm. But there is something, you know, that you mentioned and, uh, you know, just now it's like, it's okay, you can just go ahead and do it. So, you know, you have this thing of, a, you know, never give up attitude. That's what, that, that is what I can see coming from you. Um, but behind that, we would love to know who is Anne? What is your story? Have there been any setbacks in your life or any big breakthrough to which you know you have emerged out as a stronger being? And what would love to know about you in that regard? Um gosh, I mean there's so many. So many moments. I think, I mean, the main thing that was kind of big that happened a few years ago to me was I caught something called encephalitis, which is inflammation of the cerebellum at the kind of like, I think it's here in the back of your skull and your brain. And that's the coordination part of your brain. Um, it was like very rare for a person of my age to catch it, but like apparently a few other girls on the island, because I was living on Vancouver Island, also caught it. So maybe, I don't know, it was going around. Um, and so the whole right side of my body stopped working properly. So like if I was trying to write, I would like write like this, or if I was trying to walk, my leg would go like, um, and I had double vision and vertigo. I tore an eye patch, used a walker. I was just like bedridden for like four months and then doing physiotherapy eventually um, and recovering. And so like, that was really, I was weirdly very calm during the time. I think my parents are much more concerned than I was. I don't know why I was so calm. Now I would be like panicking. Um, but, um, I think that was a, and I was really lucky to make a full recovery from that. I think the only thing left over is I get tired a little more easily, but, um, I was, it was a very kind of big experience for me because it made me realize how much, how important my health is and life and like living also how grateful I was to my parents who took care of me all those months when I had to leave university that semester and just come back home to rest. Um, and then it also made me realize that I could really, I, want, I don't want to say disassociate, but I could really escape into my imagination through books, through movies, through writing, or just through closing my eyes and going somewhere else. And I really feel like if I had a superpower, it would be the superpower of imagination because um, and maybe I, I definitely need to be more present, but like, even if I'm like on the bus, I'll put on music and then while I'm listening, I'll like imagine a dancing scenario that would happen spontaneously and like what would occur and how I would dance to this particular song. But I do that like all the time, like every day. So I, I definitely always just try to escape into my imagination as many ways as possible. But something that happened to me recently was like two years ago, I moved to New York to just do like a six week acting intensive. And then I ended up loving it and staying. And now I live here. Um, and uh, then I realized, oh, there's also a lot of um, power in being present and being in the moment and not escaping. Um, so now I kind of, I'm trying to have a balance of both escapism and not escapism, if that makes any sense. And I feel like um, inventing was kind of a way of me making my own imagination, making my own reality in that sense and being present in that moment, but taking from my imagination. Um, and then writing and getting into film and all that is also kind of playing with my imagination, but putting it into the present and solidifying it. Um, so that seems to be something that I also really enjoy. And that was kind of a big thing for me to discover. Wow. I mean, at that 
age so much of wisdom uh, especially in a manner you know where you spoke about the power of imagination you spoke about the right balance and um, you spoke about like you know just be in the moment it's so important to realize that purpose that you were holding so close to your heart mm-hmm. and i think this is such a beautiful message that uh, uh, you know all the youth of our age group you know will be driving so much inspiration to continue despite any kind of ordeal that we face wow thanks yeah I, i think it's really important i've been reading a lot about like the fact that like the past doesn't i think i've been reading alan watts i need to maybe that's not the same but i've been reading a lot of like it's made me it made me very depressed at first but i was like the past doesn't exist and the future no matter how much i imagine it i'm not going to be able to control it at all and so like the only thing that really exists is like the current present moment so what can i do in this present moment to fully live in this experience um because i always would fantasize about the future and possibilities of what could occur and i still do that but i try not to do that in a healthy amount like i used to in the past because i think it's important to try and like be in yeah. the moment more yeah wow and this is so amazing i'm so thrilled to have this conversation with you big high five thank you <laughs> thank you so much for answering that um so this is a very difficult question just kidding this is a very simple question what are your favorite food song place and movie okay my favorite foods are i love from the philippines you have a dish called pancit which is like this vermicelli noodles i love that polish which is other half of me i love pierogi um and then i also love mangoes i love candy <laughs> This is not healthy at all. I love bread and cheese. I'm just a I'm just a peasant. Um I yeah, I love all the simple foods. Uh so those are my favorite foods. My favorite what was the next one? Song. My favorite song. So many favorite songs. I mean, anything sung by Elvis I love. I also love opera. My favorite opera is Lucia de Lammermoor by Donizetti. Um I also love 1970s disco music and 1960s dance music. So I'm kind of like and I also love listening in the morning to 1920s music. So I'm kind of like all over the place. And then occasionally I'll listen to a modern song or modern music, but I'm usually still like my friends are like how do you not know who this is? And I'm like I just <laughs> I've no idea. I'm like very outdated. Um my favorite place is probably I mean I The favorite place I've ever gone to is the Arctic. I was super lucky for 2 weeks when Canada had its 150th anniversary. There was this um C3 ship boat expedition around the coast of Canada and I was really lucky to join for 2 weeks while we sailed through the Northwest Passage and each day we would stop at a different remote location or community and it was such an enlightening experience um and it was truly life changing. So that's my favorite place. My favorite film I have too many. This is very difficult. Um Top Okay, five. so five. Okay. Um what well, I love Charlie Chaplin's City Lights. I love awesome. Metropolis by Fritz Lang. I love anything by Werner Herzog. Um I love I love Vertigo and I love any uh Vertigo by Hitchcock and I love anything that Mel Brooks has ever done in his entire life. That's uh, there's so many more but that's a summary. Yeah yeah I know I I I am an advertiser as well and I used to watch old film school because I, oh, I used cool. to do videos and stuff so Kurosawa uh, Citizen Kane all these things yes. I used to to watch you know. So it's awesome uh, awesome to know you in a different field. So I pass the next question to the next person I don't know who she or he is so i'll go next thanks one 
uh, some back end and we have, we are seeing a lot of uh, different facets to your personality and from science to now uh, hand on acting and there is so much creativity on all directions and what i could see is that there's a lot of feeling and empathy in whatever you're choosing to do uh, living in the present moment or you know even innovations for that matter and uh, as a futuristic perspective uh, not only are your innovations uh, empathetic uh, towards the environment and as well as uh, you know making everyday life easy for the humans uh, but they're also uh, materialistically successful and are, are gaining financial gains so now that's a pretty tricky uh, thing to do in a venture so how do you manage that and how are you trying to strive a balance where you're being empathetic and you're working for a social cause or something of that sort and yet ensuring it's commercially a success Honestly, I have not made any money off my inventions yet. I've probably lost over $50,000 getting patents oh on all my inventions, but I'm hoping it will pay off. So the hope is now that I have all these patents, I will find the right company and license them out, yep. license the patent out, and then with that make, for example, the toy products finally with the toy company. Unfortunately, due to circumstances, I'm have to, I've had to put my inventions um, on hold until September. I wish I could explain more, but I can't. Um, so I've taken, it's been nice to have a few months off for sure, but uh, it's it's difficult. It's, I mean, uh, my family and I do not come from a business background like at all. And so, you know, when companies and businessmen started approaching me when I was 15, cause they heard about my flashlight, I um, didn't realize until we had like other eyes looking on the contracts they were giving me and oh. stuff like that. They were basically all trying to take advantage of me. Mm -hmm. um and so and you know i thought i had all things i had thought i had things all figured out even last year and i had another bad experience so it's been really difficult to get a product on the market i hope this year with my current team of amazing people behind me that i'm going to make good decisions and i'm going to attract good energy and good people um, because, you know, obviously the story of the flashlight itself has inspired so many people um, and so many young boys and girls, and that's truly almost more than enough for me, but I obviously would love to get them on the market to help other people and inspire other kids, especially in the line of children's toys, so it's a much more tactile interaction where they can learn about green energy and that's completely normalized because the toy industry is not very sustainable at all. Um, so it's been a really difficult process. So I can't actually answer your question <laughs> um, properly, but I will say that I, I do hope to kind of have that balance of, oh, I want to have my things on the market, but I also want to make sure that I'm still doing things because I want to help other people inspire them. And also, I don't want to pollute the earth any more than it already is while making these products. Wonderful. I mean, that was pretty candid and honest. And uh, I think uh, that we, we all of us wish you luck and we will definitely be seeing your product soon. So all Thank the best you. for that. So. <laughs> Thanks a lot for answering. Uh, we could go next. Yeah. Um, thanks, Anne. Uh, I mean, I totally echo what Saloni said. I mean, we're really inspired. And I guess we're now at a time that all of us need to think in the direction of, you know, sustainable development, saving the planet. So, yeah, I'm happy that you're kind of leading it uh, on behalf of so many of us. Um, I have, uh, I think, a silly question, but yeah, I'll just go ahead and ask it. I'm sure you've, you've had your, uh, you know, fair share of relationships and uh, breakups and, you know, patch-ups and uh, loving people and heartbreaks. I don't know. I don't want to like get into the mm -hmm. details. Uh, I've seen movies. I mean, um, I don't know about Canadian movies, but since I'm of Indian origin, there are Bollywood movies, which, you know, which will have a storyline like, you know, the, the main, the lead character, he wants to become a rock star. And uh, until he has a heartbreak, he, I mean, the music doesn't come from within him. So like many times it's like the pain, which kind of leads you to the creativity and the innovation. Do you, mm -hmm. have, have you had any experience like that where you felt that the relationship is kind of, you know, uh, leading to some kind of an inspiration or, I mean, I hope it's not a breakup, but yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I've only been in like 
two relationships in my life. So, and neither of them have inspired anything <laughs> uh, invention wise. Um, but I will say in high school, I kept a very copious diary of everything going on, which I'm so grateful that I still read them a lot and I go through them. And right now I'm actually working on a script based off my high school experience. And I'm pulling a lot from interactions I had and heartbreaks and, you know, things like that, which obviously felt very dramatic at the time. But as you know, high school, I mean, when you look back on it, you're like, oh, what was I doing? Um, so I'm pulling from that to hopefully finish and write some sort of script about it. But um, as of yet, no, no relationships have inspired inventions. I, I it's a good question. I've never been asked that before, though. So that's really cool. <laughs> I look forward to your script, though. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, Anne. Um, uh, this is, uh, I, have, I have a question for you um, regarding your journey to inventing something or, inve or your journey for invention. Um, what I wanted to ask is that um, what was your most uh, difficult project that prom prompted the steepest learning curve? Like um, if it was an assignment, if it was what your professor um, wanted you to do. And unfortunately mm -hmm. you had to be turned back a number of times, like what projects that um, made you learn the most in your experience? Uh, thank you. I think, I mean, gosh, there's been many times. Um, I was really bad at science in high school, especially grade 11 and 12. And it's interesting, so we have the AP system in my old high school. So in grade 11, you would do, for example, chemistry 11 advanced and physics 11 advanced. So then in grade 12, you could do AP chemistry and AP physics. So because I thought I wanted to be an engineer, I was taking both these advanced classes in grade 11, but that's also the time I started being absent from school a lot. Um, and I really struggled with physics, especially, and chemistry. But in grade 12, I just could not bring myself to do physics in class or the, at least AP physics, or I can't remember if I tried normal physics or AP physics. I think I switched midway the year and I actually ended up having to drop physics because my grade was so bad. I'd rather have had it not in my report card. And I did physics in summer school for a month and a half um, after I graduated grade 12. And that was a big learning journey because basically I would go to class during the day and then I would do physics homework all night afterwards um, because it was at such a fast pace because it was summer school. And that was a big learning curve for me. And I actually ended up getting a good grade in physics after that. So that was kind of a lesson to myself that like, if I really sit down and work on something every single day, I can probably learn it pretty well. Um, but your heart has to be in it um, to do that. And I had a great little circle of friends that I did physics summer school with that we all like struggled together, which was nice. Um, but, and I think also this past year, again, I had some experiences that was resulted in a huge learning curve again about my self-worth and um, what I should demand and being more upfront because I think as a Canadian, um, I was always like, oh no, it's fine. Like, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Like, not wanting to offend people, but now this year, I think I need to offend people if necessary. You know, like, I think I need to speak up if I don't feel like in my gut something is right. So that's, a, that was a big, this has been a big learning experience for me this past year. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, like, um, trust, uh, I know, can I know Canadians have a reputation for being really, fine, <laughs> really, <laughs> really good to people. So, and uh, yeah, and also your journey from where, in uh, in physics, yeah, all of us have always had that subject that we really struggled. Yeah, with. yeah, personally, it was physics, but uh, eventually, uh, it's it's such a it's such a beautiful journey, and thank you so much uh, uh, for that and for sharing and also. Uh, for being with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say to you, Anne, you know, when you talked about Canadians and us being very nice, I totally agree with you. That, you know, there, there are times when you really have to speak up and not be nice to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> to, to share what we, yeah. Uh, you know, but thanks, team, for your thoughtful questions and really bringing out some candid and also funny moments it was it was and thank you uh, Anne. i really can't thank you enough i think you know for just being for who you are 
you know what touched me the most that your humility and your openness uh, really speaks to me uh, and i love that about you and you know as part of the team each one of us uh, i've already mentioned that i'm going to echo that again um you know we wish you all the very best uh, for all your uh, dreams to come true uh, and just keep going and keep uh, sharing uh, with us uh, whatever you learned uh, and to the audience who have been watching pearl webinars and who've been giving us your feedbacks and encouragement uh, we just want to extend a hearty thanks to you all again. You've always been inspiring us uh, to do better. Uh, and to summarize, really, from this interview, I just want to say a few takeaways to the youths and the parents and anybody who's really watching this webinar that from what Anne was saying, you know, curiosity, and I know she talked about just going with the inner passion, the inner call. Uh, she went on inventing a few things, really with the heart to help her, her friends, and I think that was just a great place to start. And uh, again, research suggests that curiosity really improves our interpersonal skills, growth mindset, and makes us think freely and out of the box. So I think we have to nurture uh, curiosity and passion in any age, really. And of course, let's be realistic. For an idea to really materialize and to be successful in this today's world, and you were saying we need to have the right uh, connections uh, you know, be more entrepreneurial about it, be more disciplined and have some sort of a structure. And I like that answer where you were again, honest in sharing that you, you know, sometimes we all need uh, discipline no matter uh, where we are in life. Um, so, you know, think about those things. And I think there were this fantastic points and also mentorship. Um, I like that one too. So as a closing remark, I'd like to say to everyone that let's be curious, let's be free and wish you all many, many aha moments in your life. So I look forward to seeing you all in the next Pearl webinar. Until then, take care. Bye for now. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Yay. guys. You all have such Yay. awesome Yay. questions. <laughs> it was really nice answering all of them. Yeah. Wow. And